I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker. Uh, many of you may not know him, but you do know him because you know his father. He's got two fathers that you know. You know his heavenly father. Uh, I could say a lot of things about him. I could say that he was called into the ministry, I believe, in 1980. I believe he uh, was consecrated as a bishop in 2019. Uh, he's an author of a book. Uh, you want the title, uh, I believe is, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so you want the title. And uh, uh, yeah, in fact, we've got some of these. If you uh, would like to purchase it, uh, this is my gift to him. Uh, but for the first 10 people who go out to the table, uh, the church is going to buy the first 10. Amen. Come on. Yeah. And so, uh, and, it's, and it's a good book. And if you're in leadership, you really need to read this. Uh, it's a good read. And, 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 and leadership, you all may see this as a requirement in 2022. I'll just go ahead on and put you on notice. All right. Uh, but uh, he's an author. He's a husband. He's a father. He's a grandfather. But most of all, he's a child of the Most High God. And he's the son to Deacon and Sister Irene Richardson. Amen. First, we give honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to the shepherd of First Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor Herb Hedrick to the officers, members who make up the official body, and to you, my father's children. Amen. I thank God for you. Amen. For choosing me to serve this 139th anniversary of this very church. There are many people you could have called, but you called on a little lowly person such as myself. So that now if I end up missing, you know why? to come and share in the honoring of my parents, my mother and my father, who have, as we will share somewhat in our message this morning, who has instilled in us a sense of purpose. To my sister who is here, my brother in his absence, the siblings, we, I thank God because in all of our years of living, there was never a sibling rivalry that I can recall of. Come on now. We, we lived our lives and our parents didn't pit us one against another. We just know our place within our parents and the baby just happened not to be here today. I know he's watching, so I had to get that one in. To my wife of 40 years at the end of this month. I thank God for her because through thick, through thin, through ups and downs, and through that times of doubt, we stayed in there and she stuck by me. Even when I didn't think much for myself, I thank God for her. To my daughter who's still here, my son had to leave because he had to be back to Charlotte, his church. But to my children, I thank God for you. Because anyone always asks about your children, the only thing I can always say is, my children make me laugh. Even though they're grown, they still make me laugh. And to my grandchildren who are not here, they also make me laugh, and I thank God much for them. Again, you're here because you're celebrating 139 years. You're also honoring my parents who, again, has a combined 100 and what was that again? 20 years, 120 years. And my son said something to my father many years ago. I don't know, re recall the, the crux of the conversation, but something that you all don't know. This is the third church in the last 40 years that my father has helped build. He's built three churches in a period of 40 years. And I don't know if the conversation was to the point that he thought he was getting ready to check out or something. My son, my son told him, he said, Pops, you can't, you can't go yet. You still got churches to build. 
as we got here because this is the first time I've been in this edifice since my parents have moved, relocated here 13 plus years ago. And we thank God for what we see and the leadership that God has placed in this very place right here. So again, I commend you, First Missionary, I commend you, Brother Pastor, my friend, and I pray that God will continue to give you more years to impact the lives of the people in this very community. Amen. Shall we pray? Father and God, as we come this morning, we thank you because we haven't been always the greatest. We haven't always been the best. We have not always been good. But we thank you because it's been your mercy, your grace, your love that you thought enough of us that even as we assemble in this hallowed space, we thank you, God, because you didn't take us out yet. Some have gone on because some were ready and some had to be called, but you left us here to make sure we get it right. So, God, we pray now, not our will, but your will be done, that in all that is said and done, that you be given the honor and the glory and that you receive our praise. Now, God, as this lump of clay stands before your people, mold and make as only you can, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For, O oh Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Pastor, I'm going to have a problem with you right now because since you walked into this church, you took me away somewhere once. And I've been trying for almost 40 years how to figure out how to do what your pastor does without this thing in front of me. I love how he just walks out here and he can do what he does. And last, what was it, last week, I think he got, almost got a shout on a little bit up in here. Yeah, I'll be watching. And I said, this guy's got something going on. God, why can't I do what he do? He said, I didn't make you to be him. But I do walk, so I hope you don't mind as, as we share because the theme for your anniversary, and I believe the theme of the rest of the month is, what are you leaving behind? When that was given to me, oh, before I, before I go, I, I, have to, I have to thank a couple other special people. Uh, Sister Leslie, is she in the room? She may be outside. Now, thank you. Uh, Sister Leslie, who has, has, has been gracious, and, 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 and thank you, thank you, thank you for, for all that you've done to accommodate us, my wife and I. Thank you. Again, I'm sorry. Going back to your theme, what are you leaving behind? And I thought about that and I prayed about that and God said, this is what we're going to talk about as we open up your, your dialogue for the month. What are you leaving behind? So we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 13. Even though you gave a focus verse, I'm going to go before and a little after it and then we're going to go back to that primary verse. In Proverbs chapter 13, 13 verses 20 through 25 and as I've heard it said whether you have your Bible or your electronic devices whatever your access is if you would go there with me and we're going to read out of the New, New International Version in Proverbs 13 20 through 25 amen he's got it there the word says, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffer harm. Trouble pursues the sinner, but the righteous are rewarded with good things. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. An unplowed field produces food for the poor, but injustice sweeps it away. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the ones who loves their children is carefully, careful to discipline them. 
The righteous eats their herbs, excuse me, eats their heart's content. But the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. Amen. I want to really draw your attention back to verse number 22. And in verse number 22, it says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. Amen. So what are you leaving behind? As a person is born and grows up and matures, we spend most of our lives inheriting things. As children, many of us are blessed to receive clothing, shelter, and food. And for some of us, it may have been scarce, but we got something. Come on, don't be afraid to talk to me. I, 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 I work better with help. As we grow older, we ventured out to acquire knowledge, skills, and an ability to display that talent, which we've learned by the way of employment. We then work to buy cars, homes, raise families, and then to go off into the sunset of retirement. All of these things and more we have garnered in a lifetime. Some of us have accumulated so much that we later have to have yard sales. <laughs> As we clear out the closets and the garages of our overage of the things that we've accumulated over life. Even as some have decided to downsize as we have come to the realization that we can't take it all with us. Hebrews remind us that there's coming a time appointed unto men to die, but after that comes the judgment. It also reminds me of the, uh, the, the parable in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21 of the certain rich man. I don't know if many of you are familiar with it. Jesus starts out this parable and he talks about there was a certain rich man that yielded abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do with all my stuff? So I thought somebody got it, somebody got it, somebody got it. Because you know how we do this. This is my house. Oh, he's left me now. I, I love this story. My, my son, my son always, when he bought his first house, he was, he was a student at Johnson Smith, graduated and, and got a job. And, he, and, and, and when he bought his first house, he invited us over and we came and blessed him and blessed the house. And he sat, he came behind me at the sofa and put his arm on my shoulder like a proud son would. And he said, Dad, I want you to know one thing. I said, yes, sir. He said, this is my house. <laughs> Now, you all know who I sound like, am I right or wrong? So in the words, as I call it in my church, Hope Fellowship, when we refer to him, Mr. Richardson's voice would say, you got that right. So when something breaks, remember, don't call me, because this is your house. Matter of fact, he's in another house now, and he kept calling, talking to me and his mother about his air conditioning unit, going up and down. I said, don't call me. This is your house. I spent my $5,000 fixing my AC a few years ago when it first was getting ready to go. So don't call me, because this is your house. He's going to get me later. I already feel it. But we do that because we, 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 we get to that place just like this rich man and we get there and say, like, what shall I do because I got so much stuff in my house, in my possession. Then he came up with an idea, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down the barn and build a bigger one and then I'll have much stored for the good for me. To which a call came out, thou fool. This night thy soul is required of you. Then who will this stuff belong to? We get caught up. And not calling, or not trying to call anyone a fool. But we got to understand, this man was only thinking about himself. His accumulation of substance. 
Not understanding that no man can live unto him or herself. Every life impacts another life, whether related or otherwise. I do remember growing up in a community or growing up with the old adage, because I'm a hillbilly raised in the city. Since they never told you, let me tell you. I'm from West by God, Virginia. We ain't rednecks, we ain't country, we hillbillies. <laughs> Raised in Washington, D.C. How you figure that one? Don't ask me. <laughs> but I've learned that in both places, it took a village to raise a child. At least the culture and the community I come from, it took a village to raise a child. Every child, even though you had a parent or both parents, they weren't the only people who were there in your life. Mess up if you want to. Thank God that they didn't have internet and access back in our day growing up. He hello, have I got some witnesses? It was bad enough when we had to beat the school teacher to get home with that bad report card and hope not to get a phone call. Because you know somehow how we used to do, phone would ring, may I speak to you? I'm sorry, she not here, she in the next room. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I, I think you're getting it. I think you're getting it. I think you're getting it. And so, 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 here, 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 this man, this man, this man thought only of himself. And even today, there are people who do think of themselves. I don't need, I don't need the stories of a Bob Cratchit and those others. I know people in my life who are like that. And then crazy enough, when they die, they try to take it with them. Now, I, 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 tried to, I tried to hope not to see this, but when I saw a hearse with a U-Haul trailer tied behind it, I knew we reached an all-time low. Mm -hmm. Because we get to a place we think that even in that part of life, we're still going to enjoy the automobile. We're still going to enjoy the artifact of our lives only to discover just as our body will decay, so will it. But, 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 but I went back to Proverbs and I saw something here that changed a little bit of my theology. The book of Proverbs is credited to have been written by Solomon, the son of King David and and, 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 and here I, I remember when Solomon became king, he, he didn't ask for stuff. You know how we do, you know, we get a job, first thing on our mind is how much stuff can we buy? We get a little bit more money, we try to figure out how much car we can buy. Not taking into account maintenance and the other costs, but, and then we try to figure out how much house we can buy not realizing what that's going to cost us. But here Solomon asked for something unique. So in his writing of the Proverbs, I believe he was speaking to three different concepts. These are not the points yet, but these were three different concepts I believe he was trying to write throughout the Proverbs. The first concept was that of wisdom, which is directed to the discerning of the judgment between good and evil in one's ordinary affairs in life, meaning having a good sense of judgment. Secondly, he, 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 I believe he was trying to speak to one's understanding, which is the ability to discern between truth and error in one's life. And then thirdly, when you read the Proverbs, I believe he was speaking to sound wisdom, which is different from just wisdom, which deals with the insight of a person beyond human and the divine. The ability to discern the inequalities of, uh, the inequalities and relationships. Because you do know everybody your, that you claim is your friend ain't your friend. I just wish Facebook could change that a little bit. 
Because many of us who are social media savvy, we got a lot of folks on Facebook as our friends, but let's be real, they're not our friends. Going back to that young fella that I just mentioned earlier, it used to be a time when he would, we were together when he was younger and we would just see people and I would acknowledge them. He said, Dad, you got a lot of friends. I said, no, I just know a lot of people. But I have very few friends. And so, so, so with that, I understood this. So what was Paul, or excuse me, what was uh, 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 being said, particularly in the Proverbs that, that we, we focused on in verse 22? A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. But the sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Many focus on the idea of a good person leaving an inheritance for their children's children. But when we keep rereading the proverb, we're again reminded that the sinner's wealth is also stored for the righteous. Okay, come on, y'all don't, don't act like y'all don't like that other one, the wealth of the wicked is. Do I have any Bible readers here? See, we love all of that when it comes to this, but, but again, what, what are we leaving behind for our children's children? And this is not only a question for the biological, but this is for the spiritual. Pastor, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm challenged during funerals. I'm challenged doing funerals because it's not the funeral that bothers me. It's after the funeral. After the funeral because then everybody who snotted and cried. Uh, can, can I be real? Thank you. I ask permission. I get tired. I get agitated. I even get sometimes frustrated because we can come here and snot and cry and act a fool. My father and I had to save a family member one year, some years ago at a funeral, and we said, please don't let this one particular person get to the casket. Pop, you know what I'm talking about. Because we knew, this is how I like to call it, we knew that if that person got, there was going to be some clowning going on at the casket. If you can't do it in my living, don't do it in my death. So, so, so I get challenged, I get challenged, I get challenged when we clown at the casket and all of a sudden, before we could even read the will, we want to find out what's my share, what's my portion. But, but if we go back and read the verse again, verse 22, here Solomon was trying to tell us a good person leaves an inheritance. And when we hear the word inheritance, we always attune it to or attribute it to stuff. But I do believe if we understood the Proverbs, Proverbs 22 and 6 reminds us to train up a child in the way that they should go, that when they get old, they will not depart from it. But we don't, we don't do that. We, we, don't, we don't train our children now. We leave it up to the school system. We leave it up to the clubs. We leave it up to somebody else. And parents don't train their children. How do I know? My wife's an educator. I know. I hear it every day. About how mannish these little people are. I raised two children. I got three grands of my own. I don't need to hear about more little people. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I, 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 I'm challenged because we don't train our children, parents. Or, 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 or the apostle Paul, when he admonished his apprentice, Timothy, that from a child, you have known the scriptures. And if you stay with them, they will make you wise. Now, don't judge me. But the late Richard Pryor, 
said these words, you don't get old by being no fool. So I believe God needs to use Solomon to teach us something more regarding to what we ought to leave behind. And just for these few moments, I'm going to get on out your way because I think we spent more time as necessary. The first thing I want to talk to you about, the first point, is that wisdom teaches preparation while foolishness teaches misuse. Mr. Richardson, my father, even though he liked to accumulate stuff, he was particular about what he had. He just didn't waste on anything, everything, but he was wise enough to teach us some lessons. But I had to go to another place to get a greater lesson in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Many of us remember that Jesus had talked about the parable of the five wise and the five foolish versions. That they were waiting for the bridegroom to come to the marriage feast. And it was late in the hour because in those days, weddings weren't held at Saturday afternoon between noon and two. Sometimes the wedding ceremony didn't happen until nine, ten at night. And yet the five wise versions understood preparation. They understood the need that it might be a while. And so that when they were ready to trim their lamps, they had it, they had what they needed. But then there were five others that thought that they could just get by. They didn't have enough oil in their lamps. They didn't have enough to go around. And they thought they could be, you know, they they thought they could just get by. And then when the call was made, here comes the bridegroom. But it was late. And this wasn't late in the evening because the sun had already gone down. It was almost midnight when the call went out. And when the five wise ones trimmed their lamps, the others said, hey, give us some oil because our lamps are about to go out. They said, oh, no, we can't do that. Because if we do, we don't know if yours will go out and ours too. So we can't do. But I tell you what, this is the first place in Scripture I found a 24-hour story. Read the scripture. Because when the groom came, the five wives went their way with the grooms into the house and the door was shut. But then when the five foolish finally found what they needed, that's why I said they were before Walmart. (laughs) They got to the place where they thought they were supposed to be and got locked out. Again, wisdom teaches preparation. You learn, many Boy Scouts, any Girl Scouts, the first model was always be prepared. You don't never know. And I live by this adage because my father taught me this, not in these words, but this became my mantra. It's best to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Oh, I got some witnesses in the room. <laughs> Excuse me. And so, and so, and so, and so here, 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 I believe what Solomon was trying to tell us That if we do our due diligence, wisdom will teach us how to always be prepared. Because fools think that I can just skate by. Now let me go back. I go back to Proverbs where we talked about train up the child in the way it should go. Because we got to stop getting this idea that just because we see it on the TV, I got to have it. Just because it's in the video, if I can just crank out a tune, I'm going to live large and in charge. No, you got to pay taxes. And in the words of Miss Sophia at the table, you don't want to trade places where I've been with the IRS. So, so wisdom teaches you how to prepare yourself and do the right thing and do the due diligence that's necessary. But if you want to live foolish, you're going to find out. A hard head makes a what? Oh, I think somebody's mama taught right. Secondly, we, 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 the second point that I want to leave with you is understanding teaches insight. Here, here, Proverbs 44 and 7 tells us wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all that getting, get an understanding. The Ethiopian eunuch sitting on the chariot was reading the scriptures, but he couldn't understand what he was reading. 
The apostle Philip came by and said, do you understand? He said, how can I understand except somebody teach me? And the spirit came upon Philip and there on their pony ride, he opened up his mouth and spoke about Jesus. Isaiah was the, was the, was the scriptures. He couldn't understand. Was he talking about a man or an animal? I don't understand. But after the unit understood what he heard, wisdom said, here's water. Understanding said, what hinders me from getting baptized? And right then and there, the Ethiopian unit was saved, baptized and saved. Thirdly, 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 I believe Solomon was trying to tell us that sound wisdom teaches complete judgment. Sound wisdom, third point, teaches complete judgment. Jesus gives another parable, and many of us are familiar with the parable, but I don't believe we looked at this parable correctly. And that's the parable of the lost son. Some of you are familiar with the prodigal son. Who had the younger of two sons ask their father to give me my portion, my inheritance now. And if you were back in that day, I see, I'm glad that wasn't me and Mr. Richardson. I'm 60 plus. He just celebrated his 88th birthday last week. I'm not even going to walk to his face now and say, you give me what's old to me now. I'm, I'm going to talk to y'all. He said to me a long time ago, until you can deal with these. <laughs> did, did, did you not say that? Yes, sir. Until you can deal with these, don't try it. I'm still alive. <laughs> so wisdom, sound, sound wisdom, sound wisdom taught us this lesson because the youngest son back in those days didn't get an inheritance. In the biblical days, the eldest son, regardless if he had 15 sisters ahead of him, the eldest son inherited what became of the father. Sound wisdom See, we, we always like the, the boy who left home. And if you read it intently, sometimes we like the boy who stayed home. But the wisdom of this story is really around the father. Because the father could have taken him out. Another one that was told in my house, but this was Miss Irene as we call her. She said, I will take you out and make another one just like you. <laughs> and if you mess with her stuff, my, my sister and brother and I, we like this one phrase, but I can't use all of it, but my mother used to always talk about how we can't let her have nothing. <laughs> I'm getting it all out now because it's going to be over after a while. <laughs> And the prodigal son, it was the father who did, he didn't fight, he didn't fuss, he didn't fight, he didn't argue with his son, he didn't give him that long story before he got it, because some of y'all know what that was like. He didn't get none of that. His father just said, okay, here it is. Here you go. Packed him up and he went to a far country where he wasted his substance. King James called it riotous. Modern language is wild living. You know, somebody know about wild living. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to get grown. I can't wait to get out of their house. I can't wait to be on my own and do my own thing. But you later find out it costs to be the boss, don't you? Mm -hmm. And so, here the young man, he spent all he could on his wild living that he ran out of money. Because smartness didn't teach him you need to get a job. And I don't know why we clowning at the funeral waiting on the inheritance. We think that's going to be left for us. Somebody's going to have to pay the taxes on the house. Somebody's going to, have to you know, don't you know you got to pay to die? 
in the way of estate tax. I got to pay to come, pay to live, and pay to leave. How do I do that? I'm dead. Somebody got to pay for it, though. So here this boy done wasted all his substance, and now he fools around and realizes, now I got to get a job. And for a Jew to get the type of job he had, that's when you got to really stoop below yourself. Because Jews didn't believe in swine. And he found himself feeding swine to a place that he got so hungry he wanted to eat what the swines ate. Then it said he came to himself. Because we all have a come to ourselves moment. Okay, in, in street term, we have a come to Jesus moment. Mm -hmm. That we realize that I messed up myself and even messed up my inheritance. Y'all gonna catch that in a minute. And so he decides to go back home, but he rehearses a line to put himself in a subordinate role as long as he knew if his father would be willing to accept him. But this is the part of the story I like. Said was when the son was away off. I don't know if Pops was checking the mail or he was just coming in from his grocery run or just checking out how his, his business was handled. But it said he saw his son afar off. Now for some of us, we would be like, okay, now what do they want now? He's standing at the road. I just wish he'd keep on going. <laughs> but I love the way the story continues because the father didn't wait for him to come down with his hand on his hip. It said Pops went to running after him. <laughs> Grabbed him about his neck, kissed him, brought him in, even though the son was trying to now spell out what he rehearsed. And his father, I don't want to hear none of that. You can get him a robe, get him a ring, kill the fatty calf. We're going to celebrate my son's return. But there's always another sibling that's got issue. You've been home and you did all you supposed to do, know to do and how to do, and then you get upset and decide, look, you're going to let your, and then, then you're going to talk out the other side of your neck. You're going to let that son, your son, after all he did, you're going to bring him back to this. To where the father had also sound wisdom had to remind him, you got to remember, everything I got left belongs to you. Here, sound wisdom teaches that when we've learned how to, 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 wisdom teaches us how to be prepared and foolishness teaches us misuse, and yet we understand that the insight, here, sound wisdom teaches judgment. And what is the judgment? You must do justly, love, mercy, and walk humbly with God. So I leave you with these words as we get ready to close. We must leave a legacy behind. What are you leaving your children and your children's children behind? I can't speak for you, so can I speak to the Richardson household? I thank God for Jake Randolph first and Jake Randolph second and, and, and Lovell H. the first out of five. Lovell H. happens to be my grandfather. Coal miner, originally from Alabama, then transplanted to West Virginia, who had made his living as a coal miner. Well, he also was a Pullman porter. A, was he a prize fighter, if I remember right, one time? No, okay. I heard something about boxing one time, but that might have been another story. But anyway, because we can fight now. Don't, don't go to sleep on a Richardson. We can fight. Woo. We short, man, short. I don't mean height, short. But, but my grandfather eked out a living supporting his wife and 11 children and then raised one of Grace's grandchildren of many as the 12th child. But he left the legacy that I am more enriched now and he's never put a coin in my hand. We go back to the 22nd verse. His father's children's children. 
My father's 7 of 11, and yet my father, I'm sure, had to fight for whatever had came to them. Because again, when you come from a large family, and you, you, you were from a large family, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. Okay, y'all gonna act like y'all don't know. <laughs> Anybody from a family more than five, raise your hand. You're from a large family. Don't act like y'all don't know. So leave a legacy. So, so, so here, 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 my father had to, had to walk on his father's father's legacy, even though his father's father died in 1910 in a mine explosion. So there was a, a gap in the legacy. But then when it came down to this part of legacy, I understood. My father has not given me a lot of stuff. And I ain't mad. Matter of fact, there were a lot of things he did least to me between my siblings and I, but I learned the wisdom behind it. And that was the first thing, learning when you leave a legacy, leave a legacy of wisdom. Stop trying to pay your way through life. My father's left that wisdom onto me because now I'm importing it to not only my son, but his son as well. Amen. You just saw two generations. There's a third one, the little fella, the little, you know, little you know, light fella, but he's catching it. Matter of fact, he caught it yesterday. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't him nor his daddy. But he caught it yesterday. So, so that's, that's one of the things we need to leave. Stop trying to save up stuff to give your children for them to fight over. Give them something they can carry for the rest of their life. <laughs> Wisdom teaches us I was once young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. Secondly, leave a legacy of understanding. One of the things that challenges me when I see close-knit families and somebody in the family says, I really didn't understand them. You spent all your life, what did y'all do? What did y'all share? What, did you, what, what was there to do? Were y'all two ships passing in the night for 100 years? What? Parents, learn your children. Children, open up to your parents. If there are any children who are watching, young people who are watching or listening, please, your friends are your friends, but your family will be there through thick and thin. Because even at death, someone always hollers for their mama. They ain't hollering for your friends, but you're hollering for your mama. Lastly, leave a legacy of sound judgment. You need to know where you are. Again, I thank God for Love L.H. Richardson, the deacon of the church. That's where this deacon got it from. That's where I got it from. And if he keeps doing long enough, that fella that was just here a little bit ago, he going to finally yield up when he get tired of running. Because I realize the legacy that God left us, what he left behind, he left us first his word. Secondly, he left us his son. Thirdly, he left us his spirit. So what do you leave behind? It's got to be more than silver and gold. It's got to be more than inheritance. It's got to be more than what you got in the bank. It's got to be more than the stuff in the driveway, in the, in the garage, in the basement, in the attic. It's got to be more than what's in the closet. Leave behind the wisdom, the understanding, and the sound, sound judgment so that your children's children will not be succumbed by the wind and doctrine that blows. And that's why we have to put on the whole arm of God that we can stand against the wiles of the devil because somebody forgot what legacy is all about. What do I leave behind? I leave Jesus for you. What do I leave behind? I leave salvation is yours, but you got to want it. What do I leave behind? I leave behind a life eternal. But you got to trust it. So what are you leaving behind?
today as you celebrate your 139th anniversary, what will be the continued legacy that you leave behind to the community of Concord? Do we leave brick and mortar for developers at one point in time, as soon as Charlotte encroaches on you as they're doing now, to tear it down and it will be no, remembered no more? Or even after the brick and mortar shall decay, someone will still remember what the saints at First Missionary did for the community of Concord and the county of Cabarrus. You didn't think I knew all that. Huh? <laughs> what will be the legacy that is left behind? The choice is up to you. God bless you.